Narayan Mamaskitam Naram Chavan Road to Mam Devam Sarasatim Piasam to do Jayodin Nesta Preyasho Padvesu Nityam Bhagoda Seva Bhagoti Utama Shoki Bhakti Bhavadi Naistiki Nigamaka Pur Garitam Param Shukam Mukadamita Jovi Samitam Pibata Bhagatam Rasha Mariam Mahoro Hora Sigova Krishna Sadam Upagate Damagani Tarona Stadu Shamasha Paranako Dinodi Dam Trauma Pia Dabishu to Bishu Dambibu, some help yet in a bit on bed to them, Prakahi de Hormo Hurred at Madame Sanglation of Anamusanti Nanyatam Chakvasadam Charanam Bujam Hare, Bajana Pakba Pata Petet Yeri, Yatraka Baba de Budiri, Govarta Tum Bajata Shadamataham Ab Madame Mr. Muni and the Granti Abka Haikadir Kiri. Itam Bhutto Gana Hari, and Arthur Pashamam Shakshad Bhakti Ogama, Logasa Dinatu, Chakri Satpada Samitam. O Maganati Mananda Sanganangana Saraka Chuksurun Miritam Yanatashmahi, Sweet of Anima, Sweet Tetanimano Vistam Sabitam Yanabutare, Sam Rupa Karamayam Tarati Saparanticum. Mandit Ham Siguru Sieta Parakamanam, Shigurun Vaishnavam Sa, Siru Pam Sagudam Sagana, Raganatam Vitam Stam Sedevam, Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana, Saitam Krishna Chetanya Devam, Sidana Krishna Padan Sahagana, Larita Shivishikan Vitam Stam. Namah Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pastaya Bhutare Srimadhi Bhakti Padata Shami Tiramani Namaste Sarasati Devi Guravani Pacharini Nirvashesa Sanyuadi Paskata Desana Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Welcome to Wisdom Wednesday Britta from up in Ogden Jean, thank you for joining us. Hare Krishna. George Govindadev. We were just on a conference call last night. So good to see you again. Such short notice. By Bobby, Natasha, Larry, Pranams, Hare Krishna. Malini Priti, all the way from halfway around the world. Thank you all for being us, and you're part of a historical event today, such as it is. <laughs> this is the tenth time we've revisited this verse. Never we, have we gone back to the same verse ten times before. Our previous record was nine times. This will be the last time we'll end up the week Wisdom Wednesday with this uh, this verse, and then we'll move on next week. Next week, I haven't decided. My Bobby and I. 50th wedding anniversary is on Monday. And after, we'll give the class on Monday, but I'm not sure about Tuesday and Wednesday. We're going to go down to Southern Utah for the rest of the week, visit the uh, Best Friends Animal Sanctuary, the best, biggest animal sanctuary in the country. Probably volunteer to do a little work in the parrot house to help out the rescue parrots and maybe a little sightseeing, the wonderful, spectacular canyon country Escalante, only uh, 30 miles from Zions as well. So um, some time together. I don't think we've ever even had a vacation probably together <laughs> in, in, in within recent memory. Of course, it's not a vacation. Everything's Krishna conscious, but a little change of gears, change of scenery for a few days. But we will be with you on Monday, that's for sure, with a new verse. Tuesday and Wednesday, TBA to be announced. In any case, historically, at least as far as our little group is concerned, we are breaking new ground here, visiting this spectacular verse. This this verse is the verse the base forms the basis for Prabhupada's coming to America. Uh, the fact that this absolute truth, even though it's imperfectly composed and imperfectly edited and imperfectly published, if it's not up to the standard of the glossy, slick, professional presentations of the best sellers, because it discusses the absolute truth of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which discussions alone can give satisfaction to our inner self, Prabhupada was emboldened to bring his trunk, his battered old trunk from India with his books, his translations and commentaries on the Srimad Bhagavatam, the beautiful story of the absolute truth, these weapons of mass instruction with no money and armed with nothing more than his books, he came to America. And a whole 
His whole confidence derives from this verse here. Have we got your curiosity up? <laughs> if you haven't been with us the previous nine times, here it is. This verse is the reason that we're joining each other this morning on this Zoom call. It's the reason there are 820 Hare Krishna temples, farms, and restaurants all over the world and growing. It's the reason why if you go onto Zoom or Facebook or YouTube and just type Hare Krishna, you will come across so many giant, towering, colossal, not just intellectuals, but intellectuals who have devoted their intellect, their intelligence to glorifying and honor the Lord, as should we all. We quoted this verse the last two days. Inami pam sas sapata sudashiba shri saksha sutasha chabudi abhita todi tirkabhi yad utamashoka gananavanam. The whole purpose of having a big brain, of having intellect, of having intellectual prowess and agility, the whole purpose for that matter of having any skill, the ability to raise children, the ability to fix motor cars, to do graphic arts, to write poetry, Britta to write novels, Jason. Um, the purpose of having any ability, and we all have abilities. No one can say they don't have abilities. Studies have shown the average person has no less than 200 different abilities. And the whole purpose of having those abilities is not to promote yourself, to get your name in the newspaper, to create name and fame, which is all temporary and illusory for yourself. The purpose is to connect in eternal devotional service to our eternal Lord, get the eternal benefit of serving the Lord in loving devotional service, and at the end of this life, go back to home, back to God. And that's the whole purpose of it. So Prabhupada came to deliver that message, and I'm here before you today for that reason, and you're listening for that reason. We're trying to stir up those talents within you, and if those talents have already ma manifested themselves, we're most likely uh, trying to redirect them to the Lord instead of to the external um, accolades and kudus of this material world. Now, here we go. Tenth time. On the other hand, on the other hand from what? Well, the last verse was the crow verse. Talked about ordinary mundane uh, godless people take pleasure in the sensationalistic uh, refuse, things that the swan-like men have rejected and thrown away. The crow-like men have gathered around those and taken pleasure in the sensual, sens, sensationalistic uh, materials such as we find in bestsellers and in popular movies. Good morning, Rob. Can you hear me, Rob? I'll catch you right away before you drift off somewhere. Okay, Rob's been unresponsive the last few days, verbally at least. He's out there listening, but maybe traveling or unavailable to comment. Oh, there I hear I hear him smacking his lips. Rob, you want to start us off with any thoughts here today? Uh, no, Prabhuji. I just wanted to let you know I've, I've been having to work in the morning, so I'm, I'm mostly just listening in. Okay. All right. Thanks for letting me know. We'll, we won't put you on the spot so much until you're more free. But thanks very much for jumping on board. We really appreciate it. You're in good company. Thank you, in good company. Thank you Brother G. We've got Malini Preeti, Natasha. We've got Bai Bobby. We've got Jean. We've got Govinda Dev. We've got Britta. We've got Jaya Sri Radhe. We've got all of our heavy hitters today. All of our stars and regulars. So nice to have you. Govinda Dev's 10 visits to this verse. Uh, there's something in the way. Good. Get the last drop of transcendental nectar. <laughs> Britta says, meh, slick gloss always makes me suspicious. That's good. That's our message. Uh, Rakesh, thanks very much for joining us. Bhakti Gary, good morning. All glory to Sri the Prabhupada. Jayashri says, heavy, heavy hitter. Reference to something I said earlier on. Anyway, thank you all. On the other hand, 
that literature which is full of the descriptions of transcendental glories of the name, fame, form, pastimes, etc., of the unlimited Lord is a different creation full of transcendental words directed toward bringing about a revolution in the impious lives of this world, misdirected civilization, such transcendental literatures, even though imperfectly composed, are heard, sung, and accepted by men who are thoroughly honest. The last two days we talked about the Lord, Krishna, Krishna means all attractive, as being the substance, the origin of creation. I saw a cartoon the other day, some students were in a science class and one student was asking a question. He says, he says, uh, so we're supposed to believe that in the beginning there was nothing and it exploded. <laughs> Thanks for that. Thanks for all your theories, all those godless scientists. We're supposed to believe that in the beginning there was nothing and then nothing exploded. Thanks. There was something in the beginning and that was Ishwara Param. Ahame Vashameva Gre Nanyat Sat. Nanyat Sat. Sat Aham. Before the Asat, before this manifested material world, there has always been existing, ever manifest, never destroyed, never annihilated, the Sat world, the eternal spiritual world, which as we described yesterday, has no need of sunlight or moonlight or electricity. Natad Basi Atesi and Nashashanka Um So, what, what we're talking about is the Lord who is eternally existing, his world is eternally existing, and from which this material world pops out from time to time. Buddha grama sayeva and bhutva 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 ratram agve prabhavati aharagame. Prabhupada gives the example that we all have anger within us. And most of the time it's contained, not, not evident. But every once in a while, the anger which is within us comes out. And after some time, it runs its course, and then it goes back in. Similarly, this whole material world, earth, air, fire, water, mind, intelligence, false ego, as well as the jivas, the innumerable tiny particles of God who impregnate this material world, they have periods of manifestation and non-manifestation. Bhutva, bhutva, paliyate. They come, they remain for some time, and then they disappear. And then after some time, of non-manifestation, they appear again. It's coming and going, coming and going, coming and going. Whereas the spiritual world has no such vacillations. It's always present. And the Lord is described as the transcendental autocrat in the transcendental world. From Him, from the Supreme Personality of Godhead, comes everything. He's full of personalities, full of individualities, a sentient being. Otherwise, how could this material creation, this emanation from him, have personality, have individuality, have variety. Were that not present in the origin of everything? It's a logical fact that something which proceeds from a prior something cannot have more qualities than its source. The source always has to have more qualities than the creation. Imagine an architect having built a building. Now the building may have structure, it may have strength, it may have certain graceful lines, it may have won awards, there may be many good things about that building. But the architect is much more than the building. For starters, he created that building and he created many other buildings. So you can't say the architect is the building. Some people say, God is the universe. God is one with the universe. No, the universe is just one seed. It's one tiny seed amongst so many other seeds, so many universes in this material world, uncountable, innumerable universes with innumerable planets. And this is not even the major part of God's emanative energies. It's just a minor fraction of God's creative potency. So God is not, it's, it's insulting God to say that he's the universe or that God is love. Some people say God, God loves. Love is one of many things he does because every individual being active and being sentient does a lot of different things and love hopefully is one of them. So God loves, um, but he has many other emotions as well. Love is the Granted, that's the, the queen, the rose. 
of all emotions, but he runs the gamut of emotions, just like we all do. And we couldn't have the range of emotions we have were they not there originally and unlimitedly in the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In any case, the point we've been repeating the last two days is that God is substance. He's the beginning, he's the middle, he's the end before the sun, the moon, the stars, Vishnu, Brahma, Shiva, there was Narayan, there was Krishna. During the period of manifestation, there basically is only Narayan or the diffusion of his energies. And after the annihilation of this cosmic manifestation, there remains only Narayan, the same personality who preceded everything. Narayana Parovyo, Narayana Paraviram, Yanan Param Bhaktam, Narayana Paravtabhya, Narayana Paravyanam. Narayan is the goal of all areas of human endeavor, of all scientific inquiry and research. Now, if you miss that, if you miss substance, then you end up in shadow, you end up in category. And that's what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about how terribly those who miss Krishna consciousness miss the best opportunity that's available, especially in this human form of life. Prahlad Maharaj says this, 30th verse, 5th chapter, 7th canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, Matir na Krishna parito shotoba itobi bhajyaragari adanda gobiyo vishadampana punapanas charvita charvananam Because of their uncontrolled senses, we're all serving God either directly or indirectly. We're serving substance or we're serving shadow. So those who are enamored with God's material energies and thus serving him directly, indirectly do so because of their uncontrolled senses. They, they have their eyes open like a kid at a candy shop. They see all of the dazzling splendor of God's uh, external creation of his material energy and they just can't control themselves, like animals. Animals, are, you know, someone's driving with a dog in the passenger seat of the car and the dog cut his nose out of the window. He's picking up all those thousands and thousands of subtle smells that we can't enjoy, but he's getting a big kick out of that. The bee tastes, loves to taste the honey. The elephant goes after the she-elephant being prompted by the sexual urges. So uh, someone who's dominated by their senses is no better than an animal and they're uh, sold out to the shadow reflection of reality this material world now who in the history of the world answer me this question ever got satisfied mucking around with shadows are you able to embrace a shadow are you able to have a meaningful conversation with a shadow are you able to have an ongoing eternal relationship with a shadow? Are you able to eat and relish and taste the juices of shadow fruits and shadow mangoes? What pleasure, what satisfaction, what fulfillment has anyone ever derived from a shadow? And this whole material world, Urdva Mudam Madashakam Ashutam Prayabhim Nachantijan Advedumana in the Bhagavad Gita, 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Gita Krishna says this whole material world is simply a shadow reflection of the spiritual world. Just as the shadow of a tree on water, the branches are down and the root is up, so similarly the highest part of this material world is Lord Brahma. And Lord Brahma, if you imagine a water line at 180 degrees, and Brahma and Brahma Lok is just uh, right underneath, upside down you might say, um, underneath that, that plane of the water line. And then below Lord Brahma is the trunk and all the, shwar, the, the seven planetary systems. And then the branches re represent all the areas of human endeavor divided into karma, artha, karma, karma, artha, dharma, and moksha. So Brahma is the first at, down, flipped, flipped over from the spiritual world is Brahma. And then if you go back, if you flip back, then you have Krishna. And Brahma, Yada, Ya Adi Kai. And when Brahma appeared, alone in the darkness on the petals of the lotus flower in the beginning of creation. He prayed to that person who created him that he, everything be illuminated, that he fulfill his desire to create a universe. And, and so then as a result of his prayers and his austerities, Krishna appeared before Lord Brahma eons and eons ago 
and imparted to him into the heart the knowledge whereby he could engineer and create this material universe. So Krishna is the substance and beginning from Brahma on down through the trunk and all the branches of this upside down tree, that is the shadow. And we have found ourselves out of home. We're, we've been put out the door because we didn't want to cooperate with the Lord. We, we wanted to be independent. We wanted to see what it'd be like to have our name in the paper. What it'd be like to have people with our name on their on their li lips. So we ended up in this upside down world, which is in fact not the real world. It is a shadow reflection of the real world. And how are our so-called pleasures in this shadow upside down world described? Puna panas charbita charvananam. We try for pleasure through the senses, eating, sleeping, sex life, fighting, uh, what is it, mixed martial arts, boxing, <laughs> wrestling, world wrestling, that's the fighting area. And what, what is the nature, what, it, what is the real truth about the so-called pleasures of this material world? Well, the first thing is that we, we have itches, we feel hunger, we feel the urge for sex, we feel sometimes aggressive. Those are no better than itches. And what we think of as pleasure, we're hungry and we think we sit down to a great meal and we stuff our faces. So what we're doing is not grabbing onto tangible pleasure, which lasts, which satisfies. All we're really doing is getting rid of the hunger. We're suffering due to hunger, and when you eat, you relieve yourself of suffering. But there's a difference between relieving yourself of suffering and having positive pleasure, being on the solid ground of self-realization and self-satisfaction. There's a vast difference. The one is just a respite from suffering. The other is the antidote, the permanent cure from suffering. Another example. You have an itch. It's bothering you. Okay, you can choose to scratch it or not scratch it. If you don't scratch it, it will eventually go away. So the advice of great saints and sages who have achieved liberation from the tyranny and the dominance of the senses is don't scratch it. We all have urges, but we should satisfy them to the minimum degree. If you go overboard for eating gourmet foods in excess, having sexual experiences with multiple partners, eating the flesh of innocent animals who do not <clears throat> willingly give up their lives so you can enjoy that luxury, then you get dragged down and down and down and down and down to more and more hellish conditions of life. Before long, you find yourself taking birth in the wombs of animals, subhumans, or even in the demoniac species of life in the lower planetary systems. And you don't want that, trust me, and I don't want that for you. So taking a look at what motivates us, at what makes us tick in this material world is called punat punas chervita chervana. The term that's used is chewing the chewed. We have a limited number of pleasures revolved around the animalistic propensities of eating, sleeping, mating, defending, and we rotate through those pleasures through various species of life, through the planetary systems, up and down, upper planets, middle planets, and lower planets. But all we're really doing is just eating, sleeping, mating, and defending out of different containers, you might say. For instance, milk. milk. The taste of milk is always the same. Whether you drink it from an iron pot or whether you drink it from a gold pot, it's still milk. So whether you have sex as a demigod with the most beautiful apsaras, heavenly maidens, or whether you have a sex as a pig, it's still the same feeling. It's still the same pleasure. It's still milk, but as a pig, it's in an iron pot. As a demigod, it's in a gold pot. And the pleasure is the same. So how many times can you go back and still get pleasure from that? I saw an article uh, six months or so ago, I think I shared it with you at the time, talked about addiction, how people become addicted. 
The interesting thing that I took away from that article was, take heroin for instance, the best high you have, never to be repeated. Pedro, my macaws in the other room, calling out for attention, said the best high that you can have, say from heroin, which can never be repeated, guess which one it is? The 10th, the 20th, the 99th, the 110th? No, it's the first one. The best high is your first one. After your first high, every other high is downhill. And why, why does addiction come, at least from a psychological point of view? Because the second, third, fourth, fifth, 110th, 120th, 520th, you're simply trying to recreate that first high. Now, how insidious is that? How diabolical is that? That you get that first rush, it's unlike anything you've ever experienced, and then you have your, your free will is denied you, it's prohibited, it's off the table. And then all you can think about for the rest of your useless life is how to, some or other, get back to that original high that you had the first time. How, how tragic, how pitiful, how sad that having achieved the human form of a life, one could do no more than chase that phantasmagoria. So another example, of course, is that sugar cane. Sugarcane in India. I remember visiting the Calcutta Temple on uh, Hindi, near Hindi High School on Albert Road, I think it was, and looking down onto the street from the balcony of the second floor, this is probably 1973, and seeing the, for the first time, this is like my first visit to India, I'm taking in all the newness of it, the sights, the sounds, the tastes and smells, and I saw from the balcony this little man with a cart down in the street. And there were these long sticks. And there was a grinder, a presser. People would come up, they would give him something. And he would push these long round rods through. And then it would become, they would be ground and there would be this liquid which would drip down into a cup. And then people would take the cup and walk away. Or they'd drink it and hand it back to the man and he'd rinse it out. I asked, I said, what is, what is that? What are they doing? Oh, that's sugar cane. Sugar cane. And I remember Prabhupada talking about sugar cane as a cure from jaundice and talking about various contexts. So I went down, it was very cheap. If you want a good, healthy, fortified, nutritional drink in India, at the cheapest price, like two or three pennies. Uh, I, I paid my mite and I got my sugar cane juice. And he asked me, do you want some ginger in there? I said, yeah, that'd be great. So he put a little ginger and it all went through the press. And wonderfully tasteful and very, very in, inexpensive. But now if you were to take those sugar canes that had already been, had the juice squeezed out of them and were thrown off in a pile on the side of the street and try to get more juice out of them, all you would do is break your teeth. You would get all numb there would be no juice. Your natural juices and saliva would dry up and you'd probably end up breaking your teeth. So what would be the use of trying to enjoy something which has already been enjoyed? So similarly, since time immemorial, not only in this creation, but throughout millions and millions of previous creations of manifestations, there are 8,400,000 species of life in each and every universe. Jala, jala, navarikistava, krimaodun, pakshanam, dashanakinam. And in every single one of those 8,400,000 species of life, in every one of the millions and millions of uncountable planets, in the millions and millions of uncountable universes in the material world, everybody's trying to chew the chew. They're all trying to enjoy sex life, eating, sleeping, and fighting. So our suggestion this morning is try something new. Go to substance. Nobody in the history of the world ever enjoyed the shadow of sugar cane. Nobody ever enjoyed the sugar cane, which has already been chewed and then uh, discarded. And it begins with a little bit of self-control. The first thing that the bona fide spiritual master asked his disciples to do, or the first thing that 
you're asked to do when you come to the temple and you're 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 interested in in what is the road which leads to hooking up with the Lord through his pure devotees? What do I have to do to join? What do I have to do to become a committed member? What do I have to do in essence to go back to home, back to Godhead? And the first thing you'll be told is, if you're addicted to meat eating, intoxication, illicit sex or gambling, you need to start to wind down on that. You need to start to exercise some control. So that eventually you reduce it, reduce it, reduce it, reduce it almost to nil. I remember sometimes in the early days, um, devotees would go to Prabhupada and complain that other devotees were eating huge quantities of halva. And in fact, so much halva, which is a sweet, that they would, they would uh, not be able to get up the next day to do their service. They would lie in bed moaning, holding their heads the, the Monday after the Sunday feast because they'd ate three plates of halva with lots of sugar in it. And Prabhupada said, never mind, that's the only pleasure they have left. <laughs> they've given up meat eating, they've given up illicit sex, they've given up gambling, so at least let them console themselves with three plates of halva every Sunday at the Sunday feast. And eventually they'll get sick of that and <laughs> be more restrained even as far as that is concerned. <laughs> so <laughs> it is a matter, spiritual awakening cannot go side by side with material sense gratification. I'm sorry. It's just the way things are. Spiritual life and material life go ill together. And so at some point you have to decide. Do you want to enjoy freshness, newness? Do you want to enjoy the unlimited potential of the spirit to resonate with the Supreme Lord and experience life as a thrill at every moment? Or do you want to just chew that which is already chewed interminably? Various species of life and various planets. Um, one must begin to reign in one's senses. Or rather, let me say, one must enjoy one's senses through Krishna. It's not that we don't enjoy our senses. We have families. Um, we have beautiful meals, award-winning restaurants all over the globe. Um, we sing and dance. Um, we we, um, we um, talk uh, exalted philosophy. We don't speculate, but we speak based on the scriptures, based on the authority of the scriptures. So everything is there. All enjoyment is there in a purified state with no morning after the night before, no hangovers, no headaches, no adverse effects in terms of your health. In fact, everything that you do in Krishna consciousness is good for your physical and your mental health. That relieves you of depression, low self-esteem. It's the antidote for all of the um, uh, uh, mental and physical pandemics that beset us in the modern age. So everything is there. We're not saying don't enjoy your senses, but enjoy them through Krishna, not separately. In the 44th verse of the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, we find these, ver these words, Bhoga Shariya Prashaktanam, Taya Parita Chedasham, Vyavishadmika Bhuti, Eka Kuru Nandana. <clears throat> Krishna says to his friend and disciple Arjuna, in the minds of those who are too attached to sense enjoyment and material opulence and who are bewildered by such things, the resolute determination for devotional service does not take place. And that's what I'm saying. You can't do one and the other. You need to, Prabhupada said, remove the shroud of material affection. Where do you see shrouds? They're usually placed over dead bodies, isn't it? You've heard of the famous so-called Shroud of Turin, which was uh, purportedly placed over the face of Christ after it was taken down from the cross. And they say it bears the imprint of his cheeks and his eye sockets and so on and so forth. So Prabhupada says, the trick of Krishna consciousness, the light of transcendental knowledge acts in such a way as we remove the shroud of material affection from this material world. <clears throat> There's a body lying in the coffin. Now, granted, the eyes are there, the nose is there, the mouth is there, the ear is there. The same eyes you used to look into and call them limpid pools of moonlight. The same mouth that used to speak uh, sonnets, Shakespearean sonnets to each other while walking along <clears throat> some waterway on a moonlit night. You know, granted, 
all the same features of the body are there when it's in the coffin. But nobody, unless they're a very weird, perverse person, would, no, would any longer have any attraction to that body in the coffin because the person has gone. The person has left that body. And once the soul leaves the body, any attraction that you exhibit for the body is considered to be unnatural to the nth degree. I remember there was a spoof movie many years ago called Kentucky Fried Chicken. I don't know why they called it Kentucky Fried Chicken. But it, one of the spoof scenes was a family <clears throat> that had embalmed their teenage son. They had, two, they had a, a couple of sons and a daughter. And then they, and they had a suburban house with a swimming pool and all. And so uh, the spoof was that they, they, they um, did not acknowledge that the soul had left some or other the body of one of their kids and they embalmed the child and kept the, the, the teenage son with them so that they would not suffer the loss of that person. Not, and, and of course, what's ridiculous is that the, 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 once the body becomes inert, uh, once the body reverts to dull dead matter, then the, the, the person has already departed. But the, but, the, but the macabre humor of it was that they weren't accepting that. And this is the mentality of the cow or the ass. So there were some sort of black humorous scenes where they're all swimming in the pool, happy, and Bob, let's call it teenage son, Bob, or at least his body, he's floating face down in the water, and everyone's pretending to have a good time, throwing a beach round, bouncing off of Bob's upside down head. And then they're at the dinner table, and they're all talking and carrying on a lively conversation as if everything's perfectly normal. And Bob's down there with his head in the mashed potatoes, you know. So <laughs> the reason this is funny is because it was unusual to the highest degree <laughs> that anybody would lack so much common sense <laughs> that they would want to keep hold of the dead body after the spirit's gone. <clears throat> and so the point is that, you know, you say cousin, uncle, aunt, father, mother, my house, my car, my job, my species. These are all like the babble of sea waves. They have no permanency. There's no substance to them. They're only shadow. In the third verse, second canto, second chapter of the Srimad Bhagavatam, Tsukadeva Goswami says, Ata Kabir Namashu Yavad Artat. Artat, everything, everything that we aspire for. Let's say we want to own our own home. <clears throat> uh, we don't want to rent anymore. We want to own. So that so we need to get money. We need to get a lot of money, especially nowadays. <laughs> Did you know that the price values of homes went up during the pandemic? That's, that's so bizarre. Never has the real estate agent been more lively, never have new homes sold for higher price tags. I don't know how that happens with people off of work. Every, anyway, never mind. That's, that's perhaps a talk for another day. <laughs> but you want to own your own home. And so, and, and so, Basically, that whole idea of owning your own home is, it's a name, home. And I think, I think one of the reasons why home, home, I think because the word om is contained in there, and om is such an attractive, mystical term. So there's just some, nobody says, I want to own my own house, or I'm going to own my own residence. I want my own home. And there's a lot of mileage, I think, that real estates get out of that. Tell me if I'm wrong. Sundari Priya, Om, it just kind of draws you in. But all that we see, permutations and combinations of earth, air, fire, water, mind, intelligence, that's all they are. Home, family, nation, car, house, computer, desk, kitchen. It's just names. The reality of it is it's just combination of earth, air, fire, water, mind, intelligence, and false ego. Why should we prostitute our hard-earned and short-lived human form of life in order to possess things which are unpossessable? They'll slip through your fingers like sand. 
They're all temporary. It's all impermanent. And so those endeavors, the, the diversion of our valuable, unique form of life for shelter, for food, for sex, for protection, and it's just to polish animal life. It's no better than the animals. It's just a polished version of the animals. Now, Prabhupada says, those who are following the path of the great spiritual masters who are trying to understand with their mind, their senses, their intelligence, their intellect, the philosophy of Bhagavad Dharma, they're weaning themselves from illusory attachment to the shadow and learning to look up to the substance. And that's what Bhagavad Dharma is. It is, Dharma is a word that means duty. So we have duties to our family and friends and country. We're not denying that. But those duties are temporary and those duties will not give us satisfaction of the soul, will not give us freedom from suffering. They have to be done in order to build character, but they will not in and of themselves be the means of our liberation. However, there's another category of duties called Bhagavad Dharma. Bhagavad means that person with six opulences, wealth, strength, beauty, knowledge, renunciation. The, the duties that we have being parts and parcels of the Lord, being produced from Him, being of His same nature, being Satchitananda, being full of knowledge, bliss, and eternity, um, and being parts of the whole, being categories from the substance. Those duties, those eternal constitutional duties of the soul with relationship to the Supreme Soul, Prabhupada says, are perfectly distinct from the way of fruitive activities. I'll say that once again. The activities of bhakti yoga, chanting Hare Krishna, taking prasadam, chanting your, your rounds on your beads in the morning, understanding the Srimad Bhagavatam and the association of devotees and serving the Lord's mission under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master, these activity, this is a perfectly distinct area of activities from the area of fruitive activities, which are considered by those on the path of self-realization to be a waste of time. Well, true, how will I pay my bills? How will I keep a roof on my head? How will I feed my family? Try for the greatest thing. Try for the thing for which you're created. Try to rise and attain the shelter of Paramam Padam, the ultimate dazzling lotus feet of the Lord. And if you think that you dedicate yourself to the purpose for which the Lord created you, He created you to love you. And if you start to pay attention to Him, wean yourself from infatuation of the shadow of His indirect energy, and to serve Him directly as one of His good sons, as one of His good daughters, do you not think, do you think that shelter and food is going to be a problem once you are engaged in the service of the almighty personality of Godhead. One insurance company has a phrase, they say, you're in the hands of all state. Well, can I tell you the hands of the almighty? And the last thing, if you're in the middle of what God wants for your life, chanting his holy names, taking prasadam, spreading the gospel, associating with other devotees, if you're in the middle of what he wants for your life, do you really think that God is going to make you struggle to keep body and soul together? And we came to Utah Valley in 1980, and all we had was we'd put a small down payment on a radio station, five acres of land. There were no devotees here. We lived in the basement of this. At that time, it was a 25-year-old radio station. We lived in the basement. We had our first Janmashtami festival on hay bales out in front of the radio station. And here we are 35 years later with two world-class temples, one in Spanish Fork, one in Salt Lake City, 25, 20 through, 20 through acres of land. God knows what land is worth nowadays. Two temples built at a cost of a million plus, one, one point two, one two point two million dollars. That radio station is still running. Now it's available. You can hear that radio station, not just in Utah Valley, but you can hear it with Wi-Fi. 
anywhere in the world. Tens of thousands of square feet of building. We started with nothing. So did did we have to get a part-time job to finance our missionary work, our missionary zeal? I don't think so. If you're working for a multinational company, do you have to worry about mental, med dental, medical? You have to worry about insurance for you or your children? No, that big international company is going to take care of all the small stuff. They don't want you to sweat the small stuff because you have responsibilities of a higher degree to discharge. So similarly, as soon as you got the human form of life, you got the potential to realize God. You got the potential to become God conscious. You got the potential to be a light to your family members, to your relatives, to your species, to your generation. Now, if you step into the middle of that, do you think that God's going to let you starve? Do you think you're going to be on a street corner asking for quarters? Well, I can tell you it didn't happen with me. Just the opposite. Krishna took me to levels of an enablement. I'm not going to say opulence or affluence because I still live in a closet. I still virtually sleep on a little small bed. I eat hardly anything. I'm just happy to get some of Hindu's dal and japatis. I could eat kitri or upma and japatis with a little achar. Now, I do have, I do have my indulgences, I suppose you'd say. It's very difficult for me to eat kitri without a nice popper uh, and a little bit of achar. So I, I, you know, I have to say that I have certain minimums. <laughs> But kitri is very cheap, just dal and rice, cheapest things you can buy in the world. Throw in a potato or two, put in a carrot. None of that costs an arm and a leg. Give me a popper, very cheap, very cheap, and a little achar if you mind, if you don't mind. And I'm happy sleeping in a closet. So Krishna hasn't elevated me to opulence, to affluence, um, but he has enabled us as he historically and infallibly has done with for those who are willing to stretch their faith, to take a chance, to put it on the line for the Lord. He has never failed them in the history of millions and millions of years. He's never let them down. I can testify in my own case. The Lord has taken us to places that we could have never dreamed by the furthest stretch of our imagination. We did not try for comfort or security. We did not try to get our niche carved in shadow. We set our sights on substance. Thanks to Srila Prabhupada and all of the disciples' concession, our life has been centered around substance, thank God. It has not been wasted and frittered away trying for shadow trying for the illusory names of this material world, which are no more significant than the battle of sea waves. In this material world, everyone wants to strive, Prabhupada says, to make one's position very comfortable or secure, although we're seeing at every moment that our existence is neither comfortable nor secure and can never become comfortable or secure at any stage of development in this material world. Uh, who can doubt that? Ahani, hani, bhutani, gachanti, Every moment we're seeing millions and millions of living beings rushing into the mouths of death. Our great-grandfather, our great-grandmother, our grandfather, our grandmother, our cousins, our uncles, we read about it all over the globe. Millions and millions of living beings going every second to the abode of Yamara as the door of death. And yet we think, yes, that's true, but I'll be the exception. What madness. Our position is neither comfortable nor secure. Say, well, true, I just want to live, just want a little house and family, and I just want to live not being bothered for 50 or 60 years, and I don't want to die in my sleep. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You left the kingdom of God at your own risk. You came to this broken, temporary, material world. It is full of birth, death, disease, and old age. And as you pursue the stimulation of the senses and the areas of eating, sleeping, mating, defending, you're going to meet with so many dangers, so many vulnerabilities. This material world is described, it's defined as a place where there is danger at every step. 
Let's look at the pandemic now. Let's look at the pandemic. Look at how comfortable and secure everyone thought they were in India just a few months ago. Yeah, pandemics passed us by. There's something about our, the color of our skin. There's something about our DNA. There's something about our melatonin. There's something about our lifestyle. There's something about our air. They're so uh, taken as, as we all tend to be. Uh, yes, we're special. We're unique. Yes, we're, we, we missed it. The pandemic gave us a miss. And, and look where they are now. So pride comes before a fall. Our encouragement this morning is put no stock in material endeavors. Put no stock in so-called material comfort and security. Put stock in the words of Krishna. He tells you the nature of this world. It is full of misery and it is temporary. So even if, for argument's sake, you find a bunker, you find a fortress to inure and immunize yourself from all the dangers, the germs and the wars and the weapons that are going on in this material world. Still, if you find some way to cope with, to insulate yourself or deal or inure yourself to the misery, still, you're going to just get kicked out. Take another birth in another womb, in another species of life, and begin again in another lifetime. The whole painful, repetitive, ultimately boring process of chewing that which has already been chewed. So let us finish with these, this rallying kai of Lord Krishna in the 8th chapter, 15th verse of the Bhagavad Gita, where he tells Arjuna, rather than waste your life, for fruit of activities and following the path of the materialists who are going like moss into the fire. Mamu Peta Purnar Janma Ukalam Asashvatam. Rather than buying into this material world of repeated birth and death, which is by its nature miserable and temporary, he says those who are Mahatmas or enlightened souls were above the average. Napnumanti Mahatmanam Samsidim Paramam Gatim. After attaining me, Krishna says, Mamu Petya Punarjan Ma, those great souls who are yogis in devotion never return to this temporary world of chewing the chewed, to this world of shadow, which is full of miseries because they have attained the substance, the absolute truth, the personality of Godhead, our loving Father who created us. Prabhupada says, and we'll just finish with this statement here this morning. Those who are captivated by the illusory advancement of material civilization, following the way of phantasmagory, are certainly madmen. The whole material creation is a juggler, names only. In fact, it is nothing but a bewildering creation of matter like earth, fire, and water. The buildings, furniture, cars, bungalows, mills, factories, industries, peace, war, or even the highest perfection of material science, namely atomic energy and electronics, are all simply bewildering names of material elements with their concomitant reactions of the three modes. Since the devotee of the Lord knows them perfectly well as shrouds over the dead body of material nature, he is not interested in creating unwanted things for a situation which is not at all reality, but simply names of no more significance than the babble of sea waves. Om Tat Sat. So our session went on a little longer than normal today because we wanted to put the cap on these 10 days of relishing and extracting the honey from this amazing verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's on the strength, it's because of what this verse is saying, that Prabhupada's guru sent him to America, that Prabhupada took the chance of coming to America with his trunk full of weapons of mass instruction, planted the seeds of Krishna consciousness in America, and here we are all today, enjoying each other's company and resonating to the immortal words of Lord Sri Krishna in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in the Bhagavad Gita, and of his devotees like Sukadeva Goswami and Narada Muni in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the beautiful story of the Absolute Truth. So, 
Thank you for my good fortune of your being here and joining me regularly. And overall, in a bigger picture, let us go through the day of being grateful for the good fortune of having attained the human form of a life and some or other intersected with the causeless mercy of the Lord through His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Let's see. Yeah, see what some of the comments. Britta says, yes, primordial soup was struck by lightning and then there was Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> primordial stream. This is this is the narrative from the atheistic scientists. <laughs> primordial soup was struck by lightning, and then there was Beethoven. <laughs> John Malik says, "My soul is listening to you and enjoying." Britta again. I had this very conversation with my son yesterday about the danger of getting caught up in internet personalities. I told him it isn't real. All you're looking at is pixels on a screen and you're sacrificing time and nature and your parents and other people to devote your time to it. Just silly. I feel like the internet is such a good way to see how we're all sort of in the matrix in this material world. Since we're all parts and parcels of the greatest creator of all creators, we too like to create, but our creations are so subpar in comparison. I have to tell my teenage students all the time not to sacrifice their entire life to the internet with its bells and whistles. It's like material world 2.0 with even more cool stuff to look at and stimulate our material senses, but then it addicts us and detaches us from the real world with real relationships and leaves us sleep deprived, angry and lonely if we use it for selfish purposes. How much more then are we all detached from what is real by deciding to ignore our great parent and stay in the sandbox, playing with sand castles and thinking we made it all with the sand he created. British, wow, what a writer she is. Amazing. But Jai Shri Radhi says, I love the analogy that Prabhupada gives the camel thinking the thorny twigs taste so good, but simply is tasting his own blood. We gave that example yesterday also. The last addiction is to prasadam. Yes. Maha prasadam sarada vidya jal jitendriya taikam. Yes. Says that that's why they're, many, they're heavy set devotees because they never got over their attachment to halva. <laughs> Ultimately, it will come in due course of time. Thanks for joining us, Radhe Sham. Adibo. <clears throat> yes. Thank you for your comments. Scrolling down, Jean, Jaya Sri Radhe. Britta is so grateful for the association. Nothing but suffering here, says Govinda. Reminds me of a movie where one elderly woman eating out says to a friend, the food here is terrible. And her friend says, yes, in such small portions. <laughs> Can we say that today of the material world? The food is terrible. Not only that, it's of such small proportions. The world is dukkha, it's miserable. Not only that, it's a sashoto, it's temporary. <laughs> Cute Govinda, that was hilarious. Oh my gosh. Let me scroll the other direction, see what we have here. All right. Okay, you're welcome to go on my Facebook page to Utah and read some of the hilarious and insightful comments from all of our joint ease. <clears throat> I'll also share that on Sri Sri Radha Krishna Temple of Utah in Salt Lake City. Um, this was it for our uh, three sessions, Motivational Monday, Transcendental Tuesday, Wednesday. We had, a, let's say, ninth, we had an eighth, ninth, and tenth visitation to this famous verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Next Monday, we'll go on to the next verse of significance and discuss that. And then Tuesday and Wednesday, I may not be with you, but Bobby and I are going to take uh, a few days to go down to southern Utah. Uh, we're going to visit the animal sanctuary, volunteer with the parrots down there, and maybe take a few walks in the beautiful southern Utah um, landscape down there for observance of 50 years together in service to the lotus feet of the substantive Lord of reality, the Lord of Rasa, the origin of all qualities and um, good attributes. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. Never forget him, always remember him. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.